The House I Live In is a film that you've been thinking about making for over 20 years, isn't yeah. it? So what made you actually pick up the camera now and make it? Um, opportunity. Um, it was made possible very much through BBC Storyville, which is where a lot of films like mine get their start because uh, there's a lot of visionary leadership in Nick Fraser, who's the commissioning editor of Storyville and is a real force. Uh, very few people I would ever mention in an interview who are really the source of a lot of this, um, a lot of this truth seeking. Nick is somebody who has armed many of us and there, uh, there are so many like me who would credit him with this. Um, uh, I, I can't tell you, but he makes it possible for us to have a starting place to make a film where once oh, the BBC is funding this, so oh, that's good. And then somebody else comes on board and says, well, we'll join you, whether it's the Sundance Documentary Fund, who've also been supportive, or whether it's um, Arte in France and Germany. So an opportunity arose for me to make a film that was um, in the spirit of previous films I'd made critical of aspects of the American system that concerned me. And so whatever was in my heart that I wanted to get across suddenly had a practical application and being makeable. And you don't have to tell me twice if that's the question. Then I very quickly pick up the camera. Of course, um, at any time, you also are trying to judge the zeitgeist. And I think that in some respect, I wondered, well, am I late to deal with the war on drugs? This thing has been hurting people for so long. I've been aware of it for so long and have wanted to talk about it for so long. But as you pick up the paper today, it's never been more current, the issue to be dealt with, because it's been this hidden horror for all too long, known only to a few who deal with it either firsthand, the families of those touched by it, or those who work in it, or those who are experts in it. The public is increasingly becoming aware um, that when Obama meets with Latin American nations, the first thing they want to talk to him about is that the way we are doing it in America not only is as destructive as it is to the American people, but has unimaginable international consequences. This is now front page news and so my hope is that the film has come at a time which is uh, which is right for it and in some sense I was judging that all along the way and in some sense you never know you just sort of plug ahead and it came out when it did and it came out at Sundance here and and in Utah when it did and we'll see what happens from here in terms of hoping that it can dovetail with the with the prevailing um, energies of the time there's so many shocking statistics and personal stories in the film as well what shocked you most when you were making the film well, the statistics are extraordinary. You know, America has 2.3 million people in prison. Um, we hold, that's more than any other country on earth, any totalitarian country, any. Uh, we have 5% of the world's population, and yet we have 25% of its prisoners. Um, the facts themselves uh, end up focusing a great deal on the destruction that's happened to black Americans. Um, black Americans, as you may know, um, massively represent a disproportion of those incarcerated for drugs. To give you an example, crack has been the sort of drug of choice in the drug war for the harshest penalties. Crack is punished historically in America, has been punished 100 times more severely than powder cocaine. So if you and I go down the street and I'm carrying five grams of crack cocaine, you would need to be carrying 100 times as much powder cocaine to get the same penalty. Now these are chemically the same drug, but somehow magically you have to have 500 grams of powder on you to get the same penalty I'm going to get for five grams. Not to say, uh, not the least of which is that you have thousands and thousands of dollars of value in your pocket. I have a petty little crime in my pocket, but yet I'll go to jail for much longer than you will. And so that crack powder disparity was one of the most shocking things that I learned about it than many people talk about with the drug war. But it's actually made even darker by some of the statistics that follow from that. I learned, for example, that though we associate crack with the black community, Blacks are not the majority users of crack in America. White people are. Blacks represent 13% of the U.S. population, and yet they're only 13% of the crack users. In other words, they use crack the same as their proportion in the population. The, not, the majority users of crack in America are white, and second, second to that is Latinos. And so now you have a situation where the majority of those who use crack in the United States are white, and yet 90% of those processed in the federal system for crack crimes are black. So they represent 13% of the crack users, but they are 90% of those processed in the federal system. And this is the age after slavery. It's the age after the civil rights movement. And so you have to ask yourself, what does that underscore as a real portrait? Not who are the famous black Americans who are making wonderfully making names for themselves and more power to it all. But if that's just a distraction, while the masses of black people are actually having their opportunity, their education, their communities, their chances decayed 
then that would be the most horrible possible outcome of that development. Then those who are gaining ground in the American space, gaining ground often in the world of, of sort of capitalistic pursuit, one would have to ask, is that happening at the expense of the many? And finally, when Move Your Money, your short film advocating uh, that people go out and transfer their money from the big banks into the smaller banks, more safe places, went viral, yeah. you got four million people, I believe, to actually yeah. move their money out of the big banks into smaller ones. Now, what do you hope are going to be the consequences, the result of people seeing the house I live in? Of course, with your banking, and I do continue to suggest that anyone who has their money in a predatory big bank that's too big to fail should take their money out and put it into small community banks and credit unions, and I'll use any airtime I have to keep telling people to do that because it's one of the ways you can vote with your money in this world where it's very hard to find a way to push a button that's that easy. And it is indeed very hard to find a, push a, a way to push a button against the criminal justice system in America or around the world, whether it's in Britain or elsewhere, that says, here's how I'm going to fix this. So what chances do you have? You have your voice. You have your understanding. You have the way you will hear, if you're an American, for example, you have the way you'll hear tough on crime laws when they're spouted out by politicians who say, I will protect you from the evil drug addicts and others. You would have to ask them, well, are you being tough on crime or smart on crime? Are you going to be punishing nonviolent people who use a drug more uh, severely than you're punishing violent people? Do you make sense? Or are you just selling me that kind of fear mongering that got people elected for far too long? So if I can change the way people hear whether a, a proposed leader is actually telling them a way the society can better itself or whether they're just really telling them what they want to hear at some fear level in their primal being. If people can separate that, I think they become much more media savvy. They become much more critical of what they're hearing. That's the basic level. On the practical level, there are areas all across America and there will be here in the UK where there is a question up for review, up for the voters' participation about how to treat drug crime. Drug activity is a public health concern. When you hear public figures deal with it as a criminal justice problem, what they are actually doing is turning it into a criminal justice opportunity because it keeps politicians in power and ultimately it feathers the nests of the sort of massive industrial complexes that emerge around the industry of incarceration. So you want to have that sensibility that drug activity by people is either recreational for them or a tragedy for them. None of it is crime of man against man. And if it becomes that, somebody does a violent thing, good, we have laws for that. Let's not distract ourselves from those activities by having an inappropriate amount of attention paid to nonviolent activity. Um, that's the most important thing I think people, I hope, take away from it, is that this was all just deeply wrongheaded. And if you can screw your head on right, uh, you'll hear the future with a greater sensitivity and therefore make better decisions as a voter and as a citizen and as someone who goes on a jury or someone who has to decide something locally.